The poet was not wrong when he said that leaders were born, not made. To see Subhash Chandra Bose, our irreplaceable Netaji, was to be convinced at once of the truth of this finding. Let me explain. We, we were at the time fellow students in the Presidency College, but he, as he attended classes different from mine, we rarely met except in the college corridors. And on he came to be the sinosure of all eyes, and began to be talked about among us all because of his radiant personality. His noble, comely figure would stand out among a crowd even in those days. There is a light on his face. We used to comment in whispers whenever he passed us by here and there. In a word, I had fallen in love with him the very first day I clapped eyes on him, and that with all my native will to worship. Once in one of our student socials, when we sat close to each other, I can still remember the deep flush that suffused his fair cheeks when I sang my father's song, Bharat Amar. We'll hold before our eyes the noble ideal of those rapturous days to new create the promised land, the end of dream and love and grace. Each grass blade of this hallowed land is blessed by God's compassionate eyes, and angels reign on this great race, their amaranths down from the skies. But although I came to feel on that day that our psyches had come closer to each other, we had not exchanged a single word. Only his starry eyes had conveyed to me, me that he had approved and responded. For all that, I longed for an outer contact with him, but I could not, taking my courage in both hands, call on him, till, lo, he came to me like mountain to Muhammad. My heart missed a beat, as he said straight away without beating around the bush, I have come to invite you to our debating society. Debating society, I gasped. Yes, he nodded. Debates must be encouraged among us. Our country, when we shall have won our freedom, must have great debaters, parliamentarians and preachers. The next incident swiftly rocketed him up into the limelight as an organizer as well. Briefly, an English professor insulted an Indian student and a hue and cry was raised. But as no redress could be obtained, Subhash came to the fore and with a few students gave the delinquent a sound spanking within the precincts of the college. Its repercussions shook the foundations of Whitehall across the seven seas and an instant inquiry was held. Subhash was hauled over the coals as the ringleader. He could have got off with a lighter punishment had he apologized, but as he refused, he was rusticated. Henceforth he came to be dubbed a revolutionary in the black book of the CID, and hailed by us all as our firebrand leader to be. Till he came to be called the uncrowned king of all and the idol of students all over India, especially after his dramatic resignation in England from the ICS. His deeply perturbed father frantically went on writing and wiring to him not to resign and court immediate imprisonment, but he was not to be shaken. While in England, his swift rise to fame was almost meteoric in its giddy speed, so much so that some verbose patriot fanciers in London sent him a framed address. Another student, burning to paint the town red and aspiring to outblaze the rest, proposed to me that we lead a procession on horseback with him at our head before the Buckingham Palace. Subhash used to redden to the roots of his hair whenever his admirers let themselves go like this. He used to comment scathingly that such soda water effervescences not got none anywhere. Emotionalism, he said, even slogan building may help on occasions, but I prefer real solid work and sacrifice. You have known so many Indian students here. Tell me how many have you met who really burn to stake anything for our country? Ninety-nine percent of them go abroad to win a degree, either to get a good job or to become a lawyer, don't they? Pooh! When such careerists talk of bullets and fight to the death, do they not become the laughing stock of the whole world? Against pseudo-patriots and fire-eaters, he used always to inveigh in this strain, emphasizing how cheap was all this gush over things that caught the eye. He used always to place application, nishta, 
and solid organizing work above, far above rhetoric and would end up with To win freedom is not a joke the lip. You remember Rabindranath's lines, Auspicious Kong's friend never shall announce thy homecoming, nor the tender candlelight welcome thee ever at night, nor thy heart's darling sparsing sweet, tearful lovelit eyes thee greet, for thee at every bend shall wait and boom the thunder clouds when shadows loom. In the context of his subsequent lonely death in a foreign land, with the name of the motherland on his lips, his early love for these memorable lines becomes invested with a deeper significance. It shows him up as the leader to be, Netaji by universal acclaim, a man whose last words were an exhortation to his countrymen so dear to his heart. Habib, he said with his last gasp after the air crash, I am dying for my country's freedom. Go and tell my countrymen to continue the fight. India shall be free and before long. Even more heartwarming is his speech to the INS troops in Singapore, 5th July 1943. For the present, I can offer you nothing except hunger, thirst, privation, forced marches and death. But if you follow me in life and in death, I shall lead you to victory and freedom. And he said to the recruits on the 3rd February 1944, Blood is calling to blood. Arise. We have no time to lose. Take up your arms. There in front of you is the road our pioneers have built. We shall march along that road. We shall carve our way through the enemy's ranks. Or if, so, if God so wills, we shall die a martyr's death. And in our last sleep, we shall kiss the road which will bring our army to Delhi. The road to Delhi is the road to freedom. On, on to Delhi. Delhi cello. It does take one's breath away. This dear and audacity... Not for nothing had he loved passionately Danton's famous exhortation in the French Revolution. Pour le vaincre, il faut toujours de l'audace. Encore de l'audace, toujours de l'audace. To vanquish them, our foemen, one must have always audacity, still more audacity, audacity all the time. I could have gone on and on to bring to the fore many hidden facets of his magnetic personality. I could have given numerous inspiring instances of his flaming soul of purity, his inaccessibility to fear, his single-minded devotion, and above all, his inherent mysticism. But as all that cannot be done within the compass of a brief discourse, I will end with a talk I once had with Sri Bulabhai Desai. But before that, I must say something in answer to some of his decriers who say that he could not achieve anything except the spectacular since India did not need his noisy army to win her freedom. All such statements stem from a warped per perspective, for any impartial critic must agree that Suvash's spectacular success in building up the rebel Indian army starting from scratch did spread disaffection among the rank and file of the Indian soldiers under the British, a fact which was proved to the hilt on the occasion of the famous INA trial at the Red Fort, Delhi. If this had not happened, and had not our rulers in India dreaded the outbreak of another Sepoy uprising in 1946, especially after the Bombay and Karachi naval mutinies, they would have kept India under, its, under an iron yoke for at least another decade or, decade or two. Had not Churchill at the end of the Second World War want that he had not come to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire? So I humbly submit that what Shubash had lived and died for would not have been achieved so soon, but for his burning patriotism, radiant personality, and above all the impressive religion he had led personally to Imphal in a campaign that was within an ace of success. His failure, however, does not mean that he had died in vain. Even such a hard and uncharitable critic as Mr. Toye had to admit in the epilogue of his book, The Springing Tiger, there can thus be little doubt that the Indian National Army hastened the end of the British rule in India. The agitation which surrounded the trials turned the issue, issue of independence for India into an instant burning question once more. Shuvash's suddenly amplified figure, 
says Dilip Kumar Roy, added to the romance of an Indian army marching, singing to Delhi, galvanize a frustrated nation out of its torpor and substantially damaged the insulation of our soldiers from the magnetic currents of popular enthusiasm for immediate independence. Now to take up the lost thread. A few years ago, in 1947, I think, I was given given a reception at the cricket club Bombay, where Bulabhai Desai, the fam famous counsel for the INS soldiers, was asked to preside. I will give here the gist of what he confided to me with a lift of pride in his voice, which still rings in my ears. I am told, he said, that Netaji cherished you as one of his most intimate friends. So I feel all the more tempted to tell you what you will doubtless love to hear. You know how prejudiced I had been against him, how ruthlessly critical of many of his activities. But now listen, he added warmly, when as a counsel for the defense of Shah Nawaz, Dillon and Seigel of the INA, I began to con over the various documents of his achievements, it simply took my breath away to have belittled one who was not only a dreamer, but a born leader, patriot, statesman and martyr as well. I tell you, I felt repentant as never before, for I could no longer doubt but that when the history of the Indian independence movement would be written, he must rank as a king among men, a non pareil who might have well claimed Napoleon's saying as his one, as his own. Impossible, there is no such word in my dictionary. Really, Dilip Babu, to have dared as he, has, as he had dared, to have created single-handed an army under the state with a bank, a hierarchy of officers, lawyers, legislators, and organizers of different departments, and all that in an alien land. Well, I did sometimes marvel at the miracle and rub my eyes to be reassured that the documents were genuine. Yes, Dilip Babu. The well old man's voice quivered. I did then bow to him and shed penitent tears that I had reduced him all along with a few others as blind as myself. He spoke with a rare eloquence on that unforgettable evening, an eloquence which made my blood tingle. As he wiped his eyes, I said to him, I cannot tell you, my friend, how deeply your tribute to my dearest friend Netaji has moved me tonight. Only let me tell you something which may surprise you even more. You have stressed his greatness as a dreamer, leader, soldier, statesman, and what not. I should only like to add that his inmost soul was that of a rare mystic, so much so that I have often regretted that he did not follow his swadharma. For if he had, I feel certain that our country would have gained much more than an abiding inspiration from his great sacrifice. What I wish to emphasize is that he was the only man I have met in my generation on whom the noble Vivekananda's mantle might have fallen. Don't misunderstand me, though. I would be the last person in the world to belittle all that we have got from him, nor have I any doubt that his life of unswerving rectitude, astonishing purity, incandescent love of freedom, and above all, his power to stake his all for the ideal he set before himself will remain a source of deathless inspiration to posterity. I would only stress that he had it in him to follow the highest call on earth, that of God, and that he could have rich reached his goal if he had harked to that supreme call, because he was by swabhav, inner makeup, what the Bhagavat calls an ekanti, single-minded, a dedicated soul. That is why he could never go in for half measures, nor help putting all his eggs in one basket when answering the call of patriotism. And so, my friend, often when I think of him, I can almost see him reciting in a throbbing voice a famous poem of Chesterton's. It is something to have wept as we have wept. It is something to have done as we have done. It is something to have watched when all men slept and seen the stars which never see the sun in a time of skeptic moths and cynic rusts and fatted lives that of their sweetness tire in a world of flying loves and fading lusts. It is something to be sure of a desire. I'm not afraid.
I'm 